Welcome back to the Fantasy Hockey Podcast. I am very excited today because although I don't have him on this list, I must say there's a new sus high candidate. There's a whole new section we're adding. It's called the Bob is Back Sus High section. Bob How many back. times have you heard this? Bob How many back. times? I know. I know. Look, I I solely exist for pain when it comes to Bob. I was saying this before we recorded. I picked up Bob. He's my only goalie now. I dropped Reimer and I dropped a Drieger. And I'm just running Bob in my points league now. So what's going to happen is Bob's going to have an incredible rest of the season. All the way, he's going to get me to the playoffs. Him, single-handedly, is going to get me to the finals. And in the finals, he's going to put up straight negative eights and tank me so that I lose. I think he's going to dump you out in whatever the first non-cashing place is. Like fourth. Look. Look, man, Bob is, I don't know what to tell you, but like right now, Bob is back. Bob is hot. Three straight wins now. He's been unreal in the past. He's already matched last year's save percentage. Not that that says a lot. What was that, like 875 or something? No, 900. Rude. Oh, God. Rude. Um, he's, he's good again, I think. I don't know. Uh-huh. We'll see. I'll, I'll, keep you, I'll keep you posted on how exactly it goes. So anyways, welcome back unsustainable wednesdays um fun fun start to the show of course as always um he also can kick ceilings you can (laughs) yeah that is proof of him being back anyways um Let's start off here and let's go into unsus high um, first, unsustainably high. Yes, I got to stop saying that because I know some people don't like it. Although I personally kind of like saying sus high or unsus high. I like it. I don't know. Whatever. Anyways, um, my first one here is going to be Andre Palat on the Tampa Bay Lightning. Doing good That's things. Yeah, I thought about I thought about picking him up. He does play in Tampa Bay, believe it or not. Also, the same state as Sergei Bobrovsky, in case you didn't know. Um, mm-hmm. The sunshine state of Florida. where A few hours apart. Yep, just a bit. Um, so Andre Palat, very high shooting percentage at the moment. Um, and more than anything, it's his IPP and his on-ice shooting percentage that's doing all the extra lifting. A ridiculous IPP of 75% over his last... <laughs> seven games for a 70 point pace um i think that palat to me is a guy that's just very inconsistent so you're gonna he's gonna go on these stretches of 70 to 100 point paces and then he goes back down to nothing that's kind of who he's been all season and at the end of the day he comes out to around a 60 to 70 point pace where he actually lands i don't know because he's not really consistent right um so i'd hold him but i wouldn't necessarily have the longest of leashes in case someone kind of takes over his spot you know right and he Um, is by the way by the way the power play pace insanity so over these last 14 games or sorry these last seven games okay he has five power play points that's good for a 59 power play point pace in an 82 game season right he's he's like he's got another one in the game tonight so there you go okay well there you go even more as always, we're recording this Tuesday night, so the game yeah. against the Red Wings is going on, and the Lightning are losing three to two at the moment, just as we expected. As as we all expected, yes, of course. Yeah. Um, all right, my first one is David Perron. Uh, yeah, <laughs> he's there's there's not a lot to try to describe how he's sitting at a, like a hundred point pace over the last month or so, but I'll try. Um. His his IPP is insanely high. I mean, he's a career like sixty five to seventy percent guy. IPP, by the way, is individual points percentage. It means um, if a goal goes in when you're on the ice, if you are a part of it, it counts for you. If you're not, then it doesn't. Obviously, so a seventy percent IPP guy is in on seven of every ten goals, whether that's a goal or an assist. He's career sixty five to seventy right now on the season. He's at eighty seven percent, and over the last month, he's at eighty five percent. So right around that eighty something area with a, a pretty increased on-ice shooting to go with it. So not only is he kind of being a part of more points than he should, but um, those there's more of them coming than, than should be happening as well. Um, and I think the biggest and most obvious thing to point at is his power play point pace over the last month, which is at 47. 
Um, he's also got four power play points in his last four games. Uh, you know, I, I, that said, and and this is always kind of tricky with, with the unsustainable episode in general, is that um, I can call him unsustainably high. That doesn't mean I don't like him. Uh, he was a really good power play point producer last year. And I think the biggest concern that we had with him coming into this year about being able to keep up his like 70 point pace, whatever he had from last year is, will he be able to keep up the power play point pace? Because Hoffman was coming in um, and we just didn't know who was going to get squeezed there. Plus, I mean, we just don't, we don't know if, if St. Louis is going to have the same uh, power play point production that they did. But I guess, I guess, uh, you know, I guess it all worked out because he's still right there on the season. He's at a 35 power play point pace compared to 31 last year. So he's right back in line with that. But I would expect the points to come down, obviously. and I don't think anybody's expecting a 100-point pace from Perron. But um, I think him having, you know, a 75 to 80-point pace rest of the season isn't crazy with really good power play numbers. Um, so he's, he's one of those, and most people, I guess, fall into this category to some extent. He's both unsustainable, but also like better than I thought he was going to be to start the season. So a little bit yeah. in between. A little bit of both. Yeah. Uh, my next one is a Los Angeles King, Adrian Kempe. What a absolute terror these last few games. So for his last seven games, he's only played about 16 and a half minutes. Uh, that's not a lot in case you were wondering. It's not a ton for an 82 point pace. That's not enough minutes for that so what's driving that it's a shooting percentage of 28 percent and on top of that he has a really high ipp of 78 percent along with an on ice shooting percentage of 15 and a half percent so adrian campe right now is fully benefiting from a lot of luck around him and his own shots as well going in um, he has five goals over that span and his expected goals for is just one so he's outperforming by four goals that's a lot um, so Adrian Kempe to me is someone that will come back down to earth phenomenally at some point. Although who knows, maybe this year he ends up being the Nick Schmaltz of the season, but I would highly not believe that. If you look back at his last 14 games, he was on a 64 point pace. I think 55 to 60 points is more in line with who he is than his current, you know, 82 or hundred plus pace. Yeah. Um, my next one. And I really really was hoping and i'm sure a lot of a lot of his uh you know people that are rostering him were hoping the same that i could put him on sustainably high but i'm just not seeing it and that's evgeny malkin um so what are we looking at here i think the biggest things to be concerned about um is the shot decrease i think that's that's the thing that's worrying me the most like everything else you can probably make an excuse for a shot decrease without a t- without without a dramatic ice time change, or at least you know being in line with whatever the ice time change is, that always kind of rings alarm bells in my head. Um, I mean, we know that the power play has kind of been up and down, and I do think that like that could pick up and kind of support his numbers a little bit. But we certainly are not going to be seeing a hundred point plus pace Malkin or anything. Um, I do think that there's some optimism for if you were super low on him and we're expecting him to be like a 65 point guy. I do think that like, you know, over his month, his last month or so, he's at like a 75 to 80 point pace, 75 to 80 point Malkin makes sense. But, you know, I think a lot of us drafted him hoping for 90 point Malkin and just, you know, or 90 plus even, uh, of course, against an 82 game season. And just assuming that like when you do that with Malkin, it comes with some injury risk and whatever. But um, the other main thing with him is, Last season, he was at an 85% IPP, which probably was due for some regression anyway. Uh, I don't think any of us really expected him to be 110-point pace or anything like he was last season. But it's dipped all the way down to 65%. And honestly, I don't I don't know. Like, that might... I, I think it might move up a little bit, but I don't know that we see him get much past 70% in general. And even in this stretch, this last month, uh, and even in his more recent games where he's been point per game or above... Uh, his IPP has not really been affected. It's just been an increase in on-ice scoring, which is even less sustainable than an increase in, in IPP. So he's he's risky, I think. Um, but, I mean, he's not... I, I feel like we saw some people talking about how they're, he's being dropped and all that. Like, don't, don't do that. But uh, he's probably not worth wherever it is you drafted him, unfortunately. And that's just the way it's going to be, even with him playing well lately. Yeah. It's 
it's crazy because he was just on on sus or he was on sus low just last week right or week before that yeah um, you got another point today because of course he did but um yeah, yeah i mean he's yeah, and I think the reasons he were on, on sus low are the same ones that he's now on on sus high. Yes, like, the same things that made him unappealing long-term are also there, the things that are still there, and he's benefiting from luck, and the underlying things that we were worried about haven't changed. Yeah, I really need to see an increase in shot production. Yeah. That would be the main thing that would make me feel better. I that and, if... and going back to like 85% power play time instead of 70%. So I don't know if like I'm allowed to do this. I've never done this on unsustainably high, but I kind of wanted to. You're not. Okay, yeah. So I'm gonna break the rules for a second here. Um, (laughs) I'm just gonna take a guy who's been at it a lot, Um, Uh and I don't really understand why. And that's Mackenzie (laughs) Wegar. He got two more points tonight. That's why. I know. Just on fire for some reason. Um, He's now 25% owned. The guy's on a 38 point pace on the season no shots um n- literally no power play time he hits i guess and has been blocking a lot more recently but i mean that's it you're telling me 25 percent of leagues only care about hits and blocks i don't know about that uh, so i, I mean I, his I, yeah his block pace isn't as high as you'd like it to be for a league like that but he does get some pins as well it's just weird that he's the most added guy He's one of the most added defensemen today. It has to be because of same day ad and people saw him get two points tonight. Yeah, it's guess. just it's just weird. There are so many other people I like than Mackenzie Wegar. Um, yeah, that one's a little bit a little bit weird to me. Um, doesn't make a ton of sense. So, anyways, that's that's kind of my take on him. Yeah. Mm. Uh, my next one here, and I'm. This is a player that I'm like a little bit concerned with from what I've seen, kind of in general with the discussion around him, and that's Alex Tuck. Um, I feel like the reaction has been overwhelmingly positive in that he's just like a good player now, and I'm not, not, that's not to say that he's like a bad player or whatever. It's just to say that, you know, you don't, you don't score on forty percent of your shots. Right, like nobody does. No, nobody does that. <laughs> the guy has a five. He has five expected goals in the season. He currently has twelve goals. Like, it's uh, he's got four goals over one expected goal for in the last four uh, five games. So, or four games rather. So you know, I I think just like hearing that bit, you probably know the rest of what his stats look like on the season. On the season, he has a 95% IPP somehow, which what makes no sense. He's He was a 65% guy last season. That's probably what he is, honestly, especially considering his line shifting. Um, he's been 85% or 100%, 100% over the last two weeks, 85% over the last month. He has just been probably the luckiest player that is the luckiest fantasy relevant player right now. All the shots are going in. Anything that that is in the realm of him touching goes in as well. Um, I mean, he hasn't really. He's I, a big I, toucher. I just, he doesn't have a, he doesn't have a ton of assists, right? Because he's scoring all the goals when yeah. he's on the ice, um, and doing none of it on the power play, which should also make you be like, hmm. So mm-hmm. I, the reason that I'm kind of like harping on Tuck in particular, it's not because I hate Tuck. Uh, it's because I I've, I've seen so much around that like he should be picked up and that he's like a top 60 fantasy player now and like all this nonsense honestly and it's just just look a little deeper just a yeah. just a just a touch a little, a little bit a little bit and realize that like nothing's different you know like okay he's got he's skating a bit more that's great and that's the like the first thing i look at when i when i try to see if somebody's sustainable okay he's skating a bit more he's shooting about the same that's not great i would like to see him shoot more than that his power play percentage is actually down. That's not good. Uh, he got no power play points in his last, you know, six games, and yet he's point per game. That seems strange. And then, obviously, if you look at the more advanced stats, like on-ice shooting and IPP, and you're like, oh, <laughs> ooh, this is smoke and mirrors. Sell this man if you have him. My goodness, sell him, especially considering all the hype around him right now. 
I will I will say um another guy that I just wanted to mention just because this is my last I just came up with this right now and I, I I wanted to mention him is um speaking of maybe one of the luckiest fantasy players you've got to put Sam Reinhardt on that list I yeah. mean the points he's getting on that Buffalo team is insane it is shocking how he continues to get points on that team when no one else could. Um, there's a lot of things that are unsustainable. About him. I'm going to be going to go into all the things. Just know that like there is a very real chance that Reinhardt goes from being around a 60 point player that he is right now, 60, 65 to around like a 45. I would not be shocked. The power play points have fallen off a cliff and he's doing this all at even strength, which is even more worrying. So just be ready to drop, sam reinhardt at some point here you know soon yeah i got one more i mean i feel like we've been on onsas high for a long time yeah sustainably high for a long time uh i'm sure everybody sees this one coming ricard raquel ricky racks yeah. has to be on here um it's really all blown up over the last really i mean for the majority of it over the last four games of his where he's got eight points and four but even you know dating a little bit before that he's got 12 points in his last seven so he was he was heating up since then, and then you look, you know, the rest of the way back to the month, and he's only got three more points at his next six games from there. So um, there are things to like here, but there's not enough. I mean, obviously he's not going to be anywhere near what he's doing right now, but I, I kind of think that we're just going to see him be, unfortunately, pretty close to where he was last season and where he's been tracking. If you look at the entire season this season, with like a fifty-five to sixty point guy with pretty good shot upside and pretty decent hit upside. Which, I mean, that's serviceable if you need that. But, um, yeah, I, I, the, the thing that's always held uh, Ricky Rack's back is power play point production, and there's no different. He's on a, now, a nine power play point pace, actually down from last season. So if, if he can't figure out the power play, and I don't believe they can, he's just kind of in for it again, unfortunately. It's, it's, it's all going to kind of round back down. Um, that said, there is a little bit of hope, um, just in general in Anaheim now with them kind of like developing some of their other weapons. Um, Max Jones, for example, uh, Trevor Zegras, uh, we've got, um, Max Comtois, you know, uh, Troy Terry is doing well, Sam Steele, like all these guys, all, all their young players are starting to really like blossom a bit towards the end of the season. And, uh, well, I guess it's the middle of it, but, um, and it's good to see that, they've got more threats than just Ricard Raquel, who isn't the biggest threat in the world on his own right. That um, is, uh, so that, that may open up things for him true. a little bit, which may open a little bit of a door, but you know, we're really kind of grasping at straws for this one. I do love Ricky Rax though. I'm so happy he's relevant again. And I grabbed him I, to my leagues. I still have a bunch of Max Jones shares. 1% yeah. on Max Jones. Like he, he's not getting points, but my goodness, that guy shoots and hits a lot. I think the points are going to come sooner or later if he keeps skating 18 minutes a game. As, as long as someone shoots a lot and hits a lot, you love them. That's yeah, all they got to do. Of course. You're not hard to impress. The guy, the guy has at least one fight this season, and he, ha he had five shots and four hits on his game back from taking a puck to the neck. <laughs> he's, yeah, he's, he's my type of guy. <laughs> that is absolutely your type of guy. Uh, okay, so should we move into um, unsusta or unsustainably low? Yeah. Now? Okay, so my first one here is going to actually be, I have two big names, and that's it. So I kept two big names um, that I wanted to talk about. My first one is going to be Alex Ovechkin. Oh. It's been a long time since Alex Ovechkin has appeared on Unsustainably Low. Uh, there's a lot of good things happening. His minutes are up, actually, from in these last, I'm going to look at his last three games specifically. Um, not a lot has changed, really, from his last three games to his last seven games. Um, in his last three games, he's playing around 21 minutes a game. It's a big increase, or not a big, I mean, you know, of a guy like Ovechkin's caliber, a minute increase is quite a big deal. Although, my guess would be that a lot of that increase comes solely from kind of the power play not working as well. Um, and so you spend more time on the ice trying to make that power play work. But either way, spend a little bit more time on the ice. His shots have actually gone up uh, from last season for the most part or stayed around the same. So, like, he hasn't really suffered this huge decrease in shot production. Um, so, I'm not too worried about that. Like, you see with Malkin, right? We're really worried with the shot production coming down. His shooting percentage is really low. 
uh, especially over these last three seven games it's a big dip it's a big dip from what his he usually shoots at and the biggest thing that's hurting him is that no one is putting in pucks around him so like he's not involved he's still getting just the same ipp that you'd expect his ipp is exactly the same as last year pretty much he's been doing that consistently whether you look at his last seven days 14 days a month whatever it is he's fine on the ipp front the big difference maker is that over these last two weeks no one's put the puck in while he's on the ice and he hasn't been involved and then he hasn't put it in himself either. And so it's really just right now a factor of, I think, Washington as a, as a whole just not doing as well when Ovechkin is on the ice and he's suffering from that. Um, I still think on the season, although I will say, I think on the season there's a good chance that this season Ovechkin does not live up to kind of that draft pick, potentially. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if that happened because of how hard that division is um, and is proving to be for Washington at times. But I do think that at the end of the day, he sus low because over the, if you look at his last 14 days, he's on a 35-point pace, and that's just way too low in my opinion. I think maybe a 65-point pace with elite goal scoring numbers is very possible um, with an upside of maybe 75, 80 points. <clears throat> excuse me. But yeah, so he's not as you know exciting maybe as you would have liked, but I still think that at the end of the day, he fits into that unsustainably low mold. Yeah. Yeah, I think that makes sense. Um, all right, my first one is a uh, player who just played tonight, Jack Hughes. Now, he could have kind of fit into either. He could have fit into unsustainably low or sustainably low. It kind of depends. I feel like I don't, when his recommendation came up, I, di- I didn't really know what people were expecting of him. Um, you know, he's sitting at a 51-point pace on the season. It's significantly up from last season, but that's not saying a whole lot, honestly. Um you know, he's got an increase in nice time, increase in shot production lately. Uh, I do like that, the again, the shots are increasing. I think the biggest, the, there's two big things to me that make Jack Hughes seem like an unsustainably low candidate. And that is over the last month, his IPP being in the 50% range, which is where it was last season. But on the entire season so far, he's at a 75. And I think that Jack Hughes um, should probably land somewhere in the 65 to 70% range, uh, if I'm going to guess. And I think he's as he gets you know more and more acclimated to the NHL, that's going to go even higher. But uh, he has that, and then he's also got an atrocious on ice shooting. And I know there's not a lot to like to, to like about New Jersey in general, but it shouldn't be quite this bad, I think. Um, so that said, you know I'm basically talking about a guy who's on a 35 point pace over the season that I expect to be at a 55 point pace. Honestly, in most leagues, that's not enough. Uh, given the fact that he doesn't really do a lot besides get like okay shots, but not the three shots a game you're looking at from a shooter doesn't really hit. Like he doesn't really have enough to warrant holding on to in, in most redraft leagues. So, you know, bear that in mind. I think, I think he will improve, but I don't think he's going to improve enough for it to matter in most leagues, basically. Yeah, I'd agree with that. Although I do think he's so slow. Personally, I almost put him on sustainably low, but I yeah, I was be, I was in between basically because I was just like yeah, what, what's the expectation that's kind of where here? I'm at? I'm in between. Not sure which one he really falls under. For me, he's sustainably low. Uh, for others, like you said, he could be still unsustainably low. But eh, I don't know. There's things that should improve. That's that's as yes. far as I would go with it. Like I don't think I don't think he's a 35 point player this season. Yeah, I agree. Uh, okay, so my next person here, pretty much literally to a T, the same story as Ovechkin, and that's Mitch Marner. The only hmm. difference is that Mitch Marner will live up to, I think, expectations, obviously. I don't think he's going to disappoint you from his draft position, but he's been really disappointing these last 14. I mean, even if you look at his last 30 days, his last 14 games, he's on an 82-point pace versus his season pace of 107. So it's going to feel over these last 30 days like he's really been underwhelming, but he is on a point-per-game pace over his last 30 days. But when you narrow that down, you get down to his six last six games play, he's only on a 55-game pace, or 55-point pace over his last six games. That's not great. That's four points in his last six games, though. So, you know, take the complaining with a grain of salt, but not bad. His shooting is still pretty high, uh, for him at least. It's still fine. Uh, his shooting percentage is really low, not scoring. Again, it's the same exact story as Ovechkin. His IPP is fine. It's his honest shooting percentage that's hurting him right now. And on top of that, 
they're just not really producing on the power play. That's kind of it. Uh, they're not doing as well, and he's not, or he's not factoring in as much as he kind of was. And so that's a big deal as well. And his power play time has actually gone down a little bit. So he is sitting on the season at about 68%. Um, Over the last seven games, he's seen only around 60-ish percent. So not a huge decrease, but it is, you know, something. They are splitting that more than they were before. So just something to watch there with Mitch Marner. But overall, Mitch Marner will be fine. This is potentially a buy low opportunity um, on Mitch Marner, in my opinion. And someone you can reach out to and, you know, because he's been kind of frustrating for a bit now, but it's not long enough to where I'd be concerned at all. Yeah. Um, my next one is, and this is another player that I feel like could fit into both molds because there seem to be really lofty expectations for him to start the season. That's Nick Suzuki. Um, he, man, looking at him, like there's, there's, there's really two camps to look here. It's kind of once again, you know, over the last little bit, I would expect him to be a bit better. Um, I know he's over his last, you know, week, he's been okay. But over his last month or so, he's really been pretty disappointing. And I think that there's, you can kind of point to to the on-ice shooting for that. And uh, and the fact that they just have not gotten any power play points that he was involved in over the last month, which is certainly holding him back. But... At the same time, you're looking at a guy that doesn't shoot much, gets decent hits, and uh, and you know, I, I'm I'm just hoping that people aren't out there looking for a guy that would be on a seventy point or seventy plus point pace mm-hmm. uh, on an eighty two game season or anything, or like a high power play point producer or something. It's he's kind of another victim of the Montreal system, um, and the fact that it's kind of slowed down. You know, they were everybody was scoring for the first month or so of the season in Montreal where they were putting up five and six goals every single game. Of course that wasn't going to be sustainable. And we're seeing that those, that affect everybody on the team. Um, you know, people are concerned about Weber and Petrie and name it, you know, Gallagher, anybody. I don't think there's a single player on that team that I haven't been asked about, um, in, in like a negative fashion. So, uh, it'll rebound a bit, but Suzuki is not like, He's not something, again, in like redraft leagues that I would be like totally clutching onto. Um, I've, I've, I've added him in a bunch of leagues and I've dropped him in almost all of them at this point. I think I have dropped him in all of them at this point. So, Yeah, it's frustrating to say the least. Mm-hmm. Just a bit. Um, do you have any more? I think you said you do. Know. Okay, so take your yeah. last one. My last one is Kirill Kaprizov. Um, mm-hmm. He's actually been pretty fine over the last month, but... Kind of more recently, he slowed down a bit, but I think what is what I like the most about what's happening with him is his increase in shot production. Um, he's weirdly, and I think this actually sort of makes sense. Over the last two weeks, he's at 100% IPP, but only 6% on ice shooting. So sort of makes sense. You know, there's there's been so few goals to go in with him on the ice in general that like it's not super unusual that he was in on all of them. But um, I, I, I'm, I'm, I think Kaprizov is going to be good rest of the season. I'm not totally sure if, if people were concerned about him or not, but there was an ask, and I think he's fine. I wouldn't look too much into these last couple of games where he's there – there was only one game where he had points. I think that might be what people are pointing at, that it was out of four games. He only had – he had two assists in the same game. But, uh, yeah, I mean, he's got good ice time. Looks like the real deal. I love that he's shooting more. He's shooting 50% more than he has been on the season over these last uh, few weeks. So that's a good sign in general. The shot increase is the thing I love the most mm-hmm. easily. Easily that's the thing that interests, intrigues me the most about Kaprasov is the fact that he's now shooting so much more. Um, and I remember that early on in the season, that was one thing that we said about Kaprasov was like when those sh- shots start coming up and the minutes start coming up, that's when you really got to start paying attention. And that's kind of what started to happen as of late. Yeah, okay. that was my last one, so we can move on. 
So let's move on to sustainably high. My first one here is going to be Capo Kakinen. I kind of briefly touched on them last week as well, but I know we got some questions about them. Um, Capo Kakinen, sustainably high to me. I think Minnesota plays a good defensive game. I know Talbot has struggled a little bit as of late, um, but Kakinen has been locking it down. And I am high on him. And I'm high on Talbot to figure it out at some point as well. Um, I do like the game that Minnesota's playing, and I like how they're playing defensively. And they seem to play better in front of Capo Kakinen than they do in front of... Um, than in front of Talbot. And so I think Capo Kakinen can become the 1A with Talbot being the 1B. Yeah, I think that makes sense. There's there's really no reason for them to try to ride Talbot when they have no. somebody so so good in, in Kakonen. Yeah. Um, oh, it's Kakonen. And Talbot, like, yeah, Kakonen. Mm-hmm. We, we know, I mean, I, I feel like I've, you, you can never really tell with a goalie, but I feel like Talbot and Jake Allen are similar in ways that if they get leaned on too much, that's when they start to kind of fall apart. And yeah. both of them are very good when given like one B type roles. roles. So. Yeah. Um, my first one is Connor Garland. I feel like we haven't really talked about him quite enough. Uh-uh. Um, He's amazing. Yeah. This, he was a player that really early on in the season, um, even preseason, we were mentioning if he gets an increased nice time from his 14 minutes a game, he was getting last season for whatever silly reason, uh, he could pop, and that's exactly what we're seeing. He, everything he's doing is basically in line with his in, with his increased ice time uh, and deployment. You know, he's he's almost always deployed in the offensive zone. Um, really, nothing stands out as like super crazy about him uh, as far as like unsustainability. His on shooting maybe is a little high, but um, you know he's not getting he's not getting totally balanced out by like a, a high power play point base or anything. He just seems pretty legit. The, the one thing that is a little annoying is his decrease in shot production over the last month or so. But uh, I do think Garland's kind of a shoot first guy. So I don't, I hope that that will not keep up, but it is definitely a little bit annoying that he's on 150 shot pace instead of his 230 yeah. on the season. And I would expect to see that go up a bit. But uh, yeah, uh, I, I've been trying to make moves for Garland in my dynasty league and the, uh, the GM is hearing none of it, but uh, I'm, I'm pretty high on Garland. That's a smart GM right there. Mm-hmm. Uh, I picked him up uh, a few weeks ago in my keeper league, um, which some people, some, some people, one or someone the other day bashed some of my moves in the keeper league and asked what position I'm in. I'm doing fine, thank you very much. Don't need to <laughs> prove myself to you people. Don't you know? I make some mistakes, sure. Overall, I'm fine. Don't worry about me. Um, so. My fir- or my next unsust- or sustainably high guy here is going to be Thomas Chabot, actually. A uh, defenseman out of the Ottawa Senators. A lot of people probably were thinking that he was going to be on unsustainably high. Uh, but when you dig into it, he's more like sustainably high, which is kind of crazy. Um, so his on-ice shooting percentage is at around 10.5% over his last 14 days. Uh, if you go back a little bit further, it's, it gets more sustainable. So he has 12 points in his last 14 games played. Um, which is pretty dang good, 70-point pace for a defenseman. That's what you'd expect from someone like Thomas Jabot if they were playing at their premium price. Like, if they were at their absolute peak, that's what you'd expect uh, from a guy like him. His shots stayed pretty healthy. He has a 0% shooting over that span, by the way. Uh, not that he's primarily a big goal scorer anyway, so it, it's not like it matters. He's missing out on, like, a goal. Uh, what really changed, though, was his IPP went up a little bit, but nothing too crazy, and his on-ice shooting percentage was only 8.5%, which really helped this last, you know, 14 days him really take off. Uh, as of late, has been that the on-ice shooting percentage for Ottawa really increased to a 10.5%, and he factored into a lot of that. And so that's really where we saw this big increase in points as of late. But on the season, and as of this last 30 days, when he's really seen a big increase in point production, that's all really sustainable. And if you look at him on the season as a whole, super sustainable. I could easily see Thomas Chabot being like a 65-point defenseman on the season, honestly, from a pace perspective. Um, I would not be shocked at all if that's what ended up happening. Yeah. The IPP seems a little high to me, but nothing crazy. I think it's just a factor as well of like who else is going to do anything there. You know, it's it's Thomas Chabot. It's his show. Mm-hmm. Yep. So this is a player that I didn't, I honestly didn't expect to be asked about, but another player that I think we haven't really mentioned enough and that's uh, Johnny Hockenpah. Over, I feel like some people that aren't in bangers leagues are like, who? But uh, he is playing 
pretty big minutes in Anaheim, and he is got to be just about leading the leading leading the league in hits right now. Big hit guy, pretty pretty good block guy as well, um, and like does a little bit in the PIM department, but not a ton. So he if he's he's a great option if you're really looking for if if Radko Gudas is gone right and you're looking for somebody who's going to put up big hits. Uh, I don't see any reason why that's going to slow down for Hockenpah. He's been pretty effective for what uh, they've needed out of him in Anaheim. And if he continues to get the deployment that he's getting, I mean, there's there's no reason that he won't continue to, to do what he's doing. I mean, he's not he, he's he's on a three-point pace. So, I mean, you have to bear in mind what you're getting when you pick up a guy like him. But, um, yeah, there, there's really... His... his his increase in hits from last season is kind of going, it's not necessarily going on, on pace with his increase in ice time, but it's going on pace with his deployment. I think in that he's, he's being deployed defensively and against better units. So his role is really to slow people down and, you know, take the body, take the body, Mm -hmm. just take it, take it. Uh, that was an interesting, I did not expect that one. Um, (laughs) That one definitely I did not expect. Uh, my last one here is going to be Dougie Hamilton, actually. Someone who was also featured on Sustainably Low at some point by somebody. I'm not going to point fingers here. Um, mm-hmm. But, you know, somebody over here kind of, you know, mentioned Dougie Hamilton. Now he's going to be sustainably high for me. Um, everything is pointing in the right direction. Finally getting involved in play again. Um, this last, you know, three games or so have been crazy unsustainable. Just 100-point pace, not obviously something that's going to continue. But if you go a little bit farther back, it does get really sustainable. Um, the on-ice shooting percentage all makes sense. The IPP all makes sense. So it looks like Dougie Hamilton has returned to this 55- to 65-point pace that you kind of would have expected, I think, going into the season um, with maybe an upside of 70. So I think that that's who we're going to see from Dougie Hamilton going forward is a 55-60 to 60 point 50. 55 to 65 i'm gonna give a big range there and then with upside on certain weeks of being you know a 70 to 75 point pace guy on a week um but more consistently you know a 55 to 60 point guy what i will say about him was the power play was holding him back and that he wasn't getting enough deployment and that changed mm-hmm. it did change so he's, on his the power season play he's at 65 percent and now he's been playing somewhere between 70 and 85 percent yeah so that is a big that is a good call out that is a big change and on top of that he's also factoring into the power play a hell of a mm-hmm. lot more um so he's been being he's been a part of all those power play points as well which has been helping right um in a similar vein my last one is chris letang um although he's not really getting much of his points from the power play but he never really did believe it or not uh, despite how lethal that that uh, Penn's power play is, he it was not really his wheelhouse. Uh, despite being a sixty point defenseman last season, a sixty point pace rather, um, he only had a a twenty power play point pace, and that's basically what we're seeing now. He's on an eighteen power play point pace. He's on a sixty point pace. He's just as you, he, he's exactly he's delivering. This is what we hope for him. His numbers are as sustainable as you could possibly get. He's a flat 50% IPP, which is basically what I would expect from a, a good defenseman. Uh, his on-ice shooting is pretty much in line for what you'd see from the Pens in general. He's still getting pretty good uh, power play deployment. His hits are still there. He's exactly who we hoped he would be. And that means he's not, you know, not going to be a breakout point-per-game type defenseman. Those are going to be harder and harder to find, honestly, beyond, like, I don't know, Carlson, I guess. Um, but... He's still, you know, one of the, he's still a D1 firmly. And I think that seemed to be in question this season. Um, not a concern. Yeah. hundred percent agree with that. Okay. Now let's move in to sustainably low. Um, mm-hmm. I've got a funny pair here. I think you're going to be able to guess the second one based on the first one. So my first one should be kind of obvious. Patrick Line. Very much in the sustainably <laughs> low camp here. So I think you can guess who that second one is. Oh, it's been a brutal 30 days for Patrick Laine. Um 53-point pace. Nothing's been going. It's gotten worse and worse as time has gone. He's almost in the unsustainably low category. The thing is, though, 
Almost the unsustainably low category? He was almost. He was he's like nearing unsustainably low categories if you look at his last three and seven days. I mean, it's just honestly pretty ridiculous. Like this mm-hmm. But I, I can't ignore kind of the negatives that are going on here. Um the minutes dipping so much, you know, playing seventeen minutes a game, that's not great. His shot pace dipping like crazy. Um, the shot pace. I mean, he did have six shots tonight, so that's a positive sign. But I mean, it's been so inconsistent. Um, it's it's just been bad. And on top of that, he's on a worse team in Columbus that has, you know, a worse on our shooting percentage than what he had in Winnipeg. Um, easily a worse power play. It's just not good there. Um, and while he started off red hot, things have gone south very very quickly. And I think he might be entering drop cat drop territory here. Honestly, I'm very close to dropping him. Um, there's a lot of good people on the wire, uh, and if you know if you're listening to this, you can also I think assume that Bjorkstrand is also a sustainably low candidate. But the thing is that to me, Patrick Line is a more important um, sustainably low candidate because of his importance to your team. Whereas Bjorkstrand, I think was always a streamer, always kind of expected to be a decent upside, a potentially decent upside guy. Um, and Bjorkstrand is doing a lot more with a lot less right now. Uh, and I've actually still kind of held on cause his shot pace has been kind of fine. Whereas line, a doesn't even have that. Right. So line, a by all accounts right now is just doing nothing. Nothing to justify at least holding him because even if he comes back, I mean, what's that point pace like now? Is it is he is he above a fifty point pace guy? I don't know. I really don't know. And and the answer might actually to that be no. When he when you look at his last thirty days, nine points in fourteen games played, most of those came off of a ridiculous shooting percentage. So he had an eighteen percent shooting percentage to get five goals on one and a half expected goals, and then he had a seventy five percent IPP on nine and a half on a shooting percentage, which is pretty good for Columbus. And that was good for 53 point pace. Not so good. who is he when he comes back to normal? I don't know. 50 point pace, 55, 60, regardless, that's not worth it. So yeah, not good. Yep. All right. Well, my first one here is, you know what? I'm going to take a goalie. I was going to make the same for last, but uh, Mackenzie Blackwood. Oh, I had him too. Yeah. I the mean, there's, I'm not even going to delve into the stats. It's just nah. like, I feel like we should have seen this coming. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, he, was, he was marvelous for the first uh, month of the season or so. And then, I mean, you can speculate about COVID situation or whatever, but I, I think that the... the the real nuts and bolts of the whole thing is that uh, Jersey's not a good team, <laughs> and and uh, you know he's he's gonna he's gonna get scored on because it's a pretty tough division and there's goals to be scored. So I think it's that simple. Unfortunately, it really is. I mean, I had him on here as well. I think you know you also just at some point the team you're on catches up to you, right? That yep. always that always happens. Um, and I think that it finally happened when it came to Mackenzie Blackwood. So, yeah, I think maybe you can hold on to him a little bit more, hope that it returns, but I just I just don't see it happening. I, I don't. I think the Devils came out with some interesting stuff, were able to hold some teams off, and now they've been kind of figured out, and yep. it's just not working. Um, not Honestly, not entirely to their fault. They just aren't a team that's there yet um, and don't have all the pieces, so... But yeah, I think Mackenzie Blackwood is solidly in that sustainably low category where I had him there as well. Mm-hmm. Okay, uh, my next one here to piggyback off of Patrick Laine is going to be Pierre-Luc Dubois over in Winnipeg. Um, he's back down to around 15 minutes a game. Mm-hmm. Not pretty. Um, he's not getting a lot of power play time. Um, hardly any, to be honest, on that second power play. Uh, just not factoring into the play. And his IPP is fine. Of course, Winnipeg's just not putting in as many pucks around him. But at the end of the day, even when that happened, this is you know similar story to Patrick Laine. He was a 55-point guy. And that was on a 25% shooting week. So, to me, PLD is a guy that 
Like it's so similar to Patrick Laine in how their situations are almost exactly the same. They were better off where they were when it comes to fantasy just because of yeah their situations. And now you take what made them good. You take what made Patrick Laine so good with teammates around him. That's taken away. That on a high on a shooting percentage and kind of good playmakers taken away. That hurts Patrick Laine. Now you take Pierre-Luc Dubois and he goes into a situation where he's not the top guy anymore. They, they don't need him to be that elite, you know, top line center anymore. They are using him right now, at least, more as a little bit of a depth piece um, and a really good, you know, second line, maybe even third line at times. Um, so, yeah, Pierre-Luc Dubois' situation is just not good. And, again, he's similar to Patrick Laine, where, like, when when think man my california is really coming out right now with all my uses of like here um <laughs> it's, it's giving, making me think a little bit like man am i really saying all that uh even when he comes back what is he right when he comes back to normal maybe a 45 pace it, it's it's not pretty um and on top of that he doesn't really shoot that much so yeah pierre Luc dubois similar to patrick line just not good anymore yeah i want to say you got a point tonight actually maybe you didn't <laughs> Never mind, well, he didn't. Of course, nope, he didn't. There goes that. Um, of course, he didn't. Well, staying on the on the Jets, I'm going to go with uh, Josh Morrissey, who actually did get a point tonight, but um, got a goal. But you know what? Looking at Morrissey and and what I'm seeing from him as a player, and this is, I feel like not shouldn't be too surprising for a lot of us who saw him spend some time on power play one last season at various times. Um. He is just not real good on offense. Mm-mm. He just, he's just not real good at it. Um, it's not new. You know, it's, it really isn't. Uh, his IPP is consistently below average for an offensive defenseman, at least an elite fantasy relevant offensive defenseman. Um, you know, he's sitting at, he had 40% last season. He's sitting at 32% this season. That includes the power play. I don't know, man. That seems fine to me. That seems like where he should be. He's he's not, you know, he's not a shooting defenseman, which I think you kind of need if you want to have a lot of impact and, and generate rebounds and all that. So oh, that's already out the door. Uh, he's got good hits and blocks. That's cool. Uh, definitely up from last season, which is nice. But I really don't think that we're going to see him be anything better than maybe a 40 point defenseman at his best. And that's with power play points. The funny thing is you look at Neil Pionk, everybody's panicking about him rightfully. So right. You know, he, he came up pretty good last season because he had a bunch of power play points and that's been taken from him for the most part. But Pionk is still sitting at a 62 point pace on the season. Yeah. Let's let's, I don't understand all the Pionk hate. Okay. I, this is something we haven't addressed yet. Maybe this isn't the episode for it yet, but like, Come on, why why is everyone so annoyed at Neil Pionk and yet he's sitting at a sixty two point pace right now? I get it. Maybe he's not on the he's not getting you the power play points he did last year, but he was only on a seven or the shots uh, or the shots. But I mean, oh, it's points wise, he's still killing it. Yeah, and he's hitting I, more. They need to put him back on the power play. One. They I don't know. absolutely need to put him back on power. Play. I'm I'm shocked it hasn't happened. I don't I don't understand why it hasn't happened. It makes no sense. Handedness, I'm sure, but yeah, it has to do with handedness, probably. But it still just makes no sense to me. It's weird. Anyways, I have uh, no more sustainably lows. I think you have one more, right? I have two more. Two um, more. Okay. My next one, unfortunately, is Jonathan Marchessault. Oof. Um, long, long time coming. Yeah, I think it's not from point production. So this is a rare player that's getting here without it being point production related. Um, his point production is. Fine. Like he's always been a 60, 65 point guy. He's sitting at a 60 point pace on the season, whatever. I'm, I'm not, I'm not overly concerned about that. He's always held back from power play points. Feels very similar to Ricard Raquel. In fact, they're very similar players in a lot of rights. Um, the problem is what Ricky racks gets you and, and that what March saw also got you is shots and hits. And what we're seeing lately is a dip in both for March saw. And that is what's concerning me. Last season, he had a 292-shot pace. This season, he has a 209-shot pace. That's a huge dip. That's a 30% difference. And his hits are right around the same. He's, he's at a 45% deficit in hits from last season. Um, I, don't, I wouldn't drop him. Like I, I feel like 
especially for like Tuck, which I feel like is the, is the obvious other answer, <laughs> which I think I'm sure that that exchange has been made plenty of times already. But um, it's, it's, it's disappointing, I think is the easiest way to put it. Uh, I don't really, his, his, he's still playing well. That's the thing. He's, his IPP is above last season, but not like out of the realm of possibility for a good player. Uh, his on ice shooting's fine. Some of his power play has been taken away, but he was never a huge power play guy anyway. Uh, it's just the shot production is the biggest concern to me. Uh, and I think that might have a little bit to do with him being deployed a little bit less in the offensive zone. But, I mean, I'm not dropping him. I, I feel like he's he's in a weird situation right now where he's like not tradable. He's not somebody I would necessarily target in a trade maybe. Um, but I also wouldn't drop him. Uh, unless I'm in desperation mode. So I'm basically just hanging on and hoping that the shots come back. But unfortunately, I don't really see I don't see an avenue for that. Yeah. Yeah. It, it doesn't really make much. I mean, shots per 60 on the season are down quite a bit. Yeah. Um, everything's down for him. Everything, for is, everything is just not. Everything that has to do I don't do have the answers, with, though. I, yeah. I, it, it's, it seems very strange that both his hits. Usually when shots dip on a I, player like Marchessault, you see the hits come up. That's what you saw with, with Ricky Rax. Um, I feel like some of it might just be play style and also kind of the team around him taking up more. There's just maybe. more weapons I around mean, we, him. We a saw his bit. line move around a bit too. Yeah. I think he's back into like nor- back into his, his typical line. He lost um power play one to Riley Smith and Tuck for a you minute, know, but I don't really know what power play one even is on that team. So there is one big thing that changed for him. Um, which is his offensive zone start percentage. Yeah, yeah, I mentioned that. Yeah. He's yeah. But the thing is, with him starting more in the defensive zone, I would expect more hits. But uh, I don't know. Not necessarily. I mean, it, it depends on where he plays on the ice, too, right? Like, yeah. I would. Ex- I don't necessarily expect hits to go up with that more defensive zone Not start. Up. I'm just surprised it's gone down so much. Yeah, that's fair. But down by as much as they have is definitely weird. Yep. Not exactly normal. My last one here. Is Rasmus Dahlin. Yep. Look how they massacred my boy. Yep. It's just too much. <laughs> it's just too much. Too much over there. Um, too much badness. Yeah. Plus, him sitting at a 60% IPP last season, that's really high for it. For, I mean, it's not really high, but it's pretty high for a defenseman. It is. And even with that, it got him 55 points. So I think there's a lot about around... Um, expectations around Buffalo this season, especially with the additions with the addition of Hall and with Dylan Cousins, you know, and, and with some of these other players that seemed interesting, um, that we expected there to be a boost for just about everybody. You know, we expected Hall to have a better season than he did in, in Arizona. We expected uh, Eichel to have a really good season. We expected Reinhardt and Olafson uh, and Dalene all to have good seasons. Um, and I, I think at this point, there's no reason to expect any of them to really improve in any dramatic fashion. Um, Darlene's numbers look what I'd expect, and he's certainly getting plenty of help on the power plays on a 29 power play point pace. That's solid. Um, but they that, can't convert at even strength at all, that, and I don't see it changing. And that's like something that worries me a ton when it comes to any Buffalo player such as Victor Olofsson and such, right? As soon as that power play dries up, that's it. Goodbye points, because they just Mm -hmm. do not get it done at even strength. And that's kind of what's happening right now, and it's not pretty. I agree. I almost traded for Darlene at the beginning of the season. I'm so happy I did it. Yeah, thrilled I did it. Um, I really... Also on a 41-shot pace over his last four games. Oof. (laughs) Here, fun, Fun fact... Over the over the last four games, his points pace and shots on goal pace are the same. <laughs> yep. <laughs> oh, that's not good. R.P. Dalling. Well, been a now, uh, now, well, now, uh, what's their faces? Buffalo can continue their seventh annual fire sale. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a. Uh, that's great stuff. So we, I did want to mention one thing for those who stuck around uh, till the end of the episode and also join us on Sit Start Saturdays. We had said on Sit Start Saturdays we'd tell a little story um, that we have from our past to do oh with boy. a certain fantasy site um, for those that might have missed it and don't know the history of it. We'll tell, we'll tell it on Friday as part of 10 Takes. 
um, it'll be one of the 10 takes. So yeah, sure. In, ca- in case you were looking for where that was, because I know we had said we might talk about it on Monday. Um, that'll be on 10 takes. And then there was going to be a special episode that dropped Monday evening as we teased, but due to just kind of scheduling conflicts and stuff, we couldn't get it done. So maybe one day that'll get done. Apologies. That never happened. Um, but we promise it is exciting and hopefully happens at some point. Anyways, there you go. That is unsustainable. Thank you so much for listening. We'll catch you next time. Yep. Thanks for listening.